I'm King Lincoln, it's the middle of October, so it's time for the Game Pass October 2022 review. I'm back once again with 16 new titles to Game Pass with a focus on what's on the PC. I've spent a night, about 3-4 to four hours on almost every game, and now I'm ready to talk about what's good, what's bad, and who's going to enjoy each title. I am putting out this video before Plague Tale Requiem that is on this list, and I really want to cover that game, but this video would come out much later than I wanted. Don't worry, I'll get it first next month, and I have a good feeling that it will be another really high quality game. I do have some news for the channel in this series, but I'm going to be saving it for the end of this video so we can focus on what's important here. The games. We're going to be starting with a familiar title for this channel. It's a game I've already talked about this month, so let's roll back time and go over it once more. Deathloop. Reliving the same day over and over again. Deathloop is another time loop game, but unlike 12 minutes, this is a great action game by Arcane Studios. Players will relive the same day, trying to break the loop, but will explore four different areas with four distinct time of day per area, and be tasked with taking out eight total targets. And yes, that does mean this is harder than it sounds, but after each day is over, time restarts and everything you do will be reverted. Well, mostly. After 4 hours here, I still need more time to get to the meat of this game. There's a great concept here and I'm really excited to play more, however I'm still unlocking key parts of the game and a large amount of the game is discovering key intel. And while this is solid, I still think Dishonored is the better title from Arcane Studios. Pick this up if you like the idea of a time loop mechanic. You'll be replaying the levels a few times trying to find out all the tricks, but this time loop mechanic feels just as comfortable as it was in The Forgotten City and Outer Wilds. This is a title I will be revisiting, more on that later. Also just as a quick heads up, this game has a lot of swearing, mostly the F word. It's sometimes used every other line. If you don't want that, play something else. Beacon Pines, a furry storybook. Beacon Pines has the player taking on the role of a young child who is exploring the town that they live in and finding several mysteries that will intrigue players. This game is mostly a simple visual novel, but has an interesting method of a choose your own adventure. Players will use words to describe which way the story will go. Part of the fun in these games is rolling back time and trying to decide something different, but in Beacon Pines, that's actually what the game is expecting you to do. Some of the choices are only available after you go down a different path. It's the writing that will keep players engaged with the story, but also it's a lot of colorful coding on a simple visual novel. But unlike typical visual novels, the gameplay here pretty much requires the player to go down all the wrong paths. It's a design choice, but it might upset some players. Pick this up if you want a strong story and a visual novel. I'm actually intrigued at what's going on here. Going down all the branches of every story reminds me quite a bit of Zero Escape, but here every branch feels different and it's a joy to explore the story rather than needless repetition. Slime Rancher 2 – Growing Slimes and Profiting from Their Delicious Poo In Slime Rancher, you grow slimes, farm gems from them, and sell the gems to earn money and make upgrades. The fact is, right now, that's also pretty much Slime Rancher 2. There are a few new features and changes, including needing materials for your upgrades, but in general, this is a very similar game, with even more slimes, as well as new pieces to farm. And as a fan of the first game, I'm sad to say I really don't like this. Now hold up, I don't like this version of it. This is early access, but it feels almost the same as the original game. The story is weak right now, no tutorial really, and the first three hours feel exactly the same as the first game. That's not exactly what I was hoping for right out of the gate. Pick this up if you absolutely must have some Slime Rancher. On Game Pass they removed the original game, and this is still good, but I'm really struggling with it because early access makes it so I can't tell if this is a great game that is currently lacking major features, or if it will feel functionally the same as the first game, because if so, you know, I think it's going to be too similar. I'll give them time and revisit this game next year or whenever it leaves early access. Spider Heck, co-op brawling with spider drones. Spider Heck is designed to be a co-op or multiplayer battler. Players get various weapons and use them to blast enemies, whether those enemies are humans or AI drones. The gameplay here is fast paced and has a decent number of weapons. It's the controls on the spider that really makes this work. Players can swing around the arena, grabbing weapons with a quick button press, and then swing into their enemies and attack them. 
This is designed as a couch co-op game for in-person play to get the best experience. There is content people can play by themselves, focusing on wave attacks, but it's not as fun and can still be played in multiplayer. If you have people you want to play with and want to play something different than, well, Smash Brothers, this is a perfect choice to mix it up. But outside of the couch co-op, I really don't think this is amazing. Pick this up, as I said, if you want to play some couch co-op. This is pretty fun and will entertain a group of friends for a while, but it's so limited outside that. And honestly, couch co-op is still a very rare occurrence in 2022. Still, it could be quite fun for the right group of people. Grounded. Honey, I Shrunk the Survival Game. I'm old. I grew up in the 80s, and one of the best movies when I was a kid was Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, where four teens had to explore the outdoors and survive. Grounded takes that plot and makes it into a video game, and that works extremely well. The environment is huge, and spotting different landmarks from juice boxes to baseballs is a unique feeling. There's an imposing feeling to the hostile world as well. While Grounded has a story and quests, at its heart Grounded is a survival game. In the beginning there are a lot of dangerous enemies and stealth or evasion is most of what the player will be able to do. This can be frustrating when enemies sometimes camp on top of your corpse, but the building and exploration work extremely well here. Pick this up if you like survival games and this sounds interesting. This is intended to be played out by up to 4 players and I'm curious how the game will work with more. Even solo the experience went rather well and I'm oddly curious how the rest of the game will play out. If you like the idea of being shrunk down and experiencing the world from a new view, this is a perfect choice. Moon Scars. It's a Souls-like Metroidvania. Moon Scars reminds me of Blasphemous. Adapting the challenging Souls formula to a 2D game isn't a new thing, but it works well here. Moon Scars will punish the player, but also includes enough features that players should be able to master it. The most essential move is a parry that will let players inflict huge damage on a risk-reward system. Moonscars loses me on its story though. The game constantly tries to tell this large epic story, but doesn't introduce players to the narrative concepts in the world. It'll be a great story for someone who studies all the lore in Dark Souls, but it's a bit too present to be completely ignored by everyone else. This is also decently hard, where I've spent at least 3 hours and have yet to reach a boss, but I have grown bored of it, you know, a couple times. Pick this up if you like the Souls formula and want to play a metroidvania of that style. There are a lot of fresh ideas here, but at the end of the day, the world building wasn't interesting enough to make me want to continue. One lap to go. Core Patrol Grand Prix, an average racer. Ah, once again, I have to tackle a Paw Patrol game, and in Paw Patrol Grand Prix, it's a racing game. This is done in the Mario Kart style, race your carts around a track, pick up attacks, use a super ability, it's pretty typical for this genre. You'll race through a rather boring story, but get to see all the characters from the show. I was ready to enjoy this, but my god, playing on hard you dominate the entire race for 90% where you never see another cart until the final two turns when someone comes out of nowhere entirely too fast, and even if you're using a special ability they can move in front of you and win. It's the worst rubber band AI I've ever seen. Pick this up if your kid likes Power Patrol, it's a simple cart racer but I would avoid the hard difficulty. It's probably better in multiplayer than even playing the story. You know, it's not awful, but seeing the AI cheat in the same way in 5 consecutive races is kind of insane. Valheim, a Norse survival game. Valheim got popular at launch very quickly and it's easy to see why. This is a well-designed survival game focused more on exploration and discovery rather than the normal survival. Players will start scavenging and need to build tools in a camp, but will quickly move on to different locations as they have to hunt down large and impressive bosses. But Valheim is still a survival game and it will leave most players rushing to the wikis to understand it. I couldn't figure out how to mine ore, which it turns out you need to wait until you beat the first boss. A lot of this game still feels confusing and if I was going to stick with it, I feel like it would require a lot of tutorials. Pick this up if you love the survival genre. Honestly, this is probably the best I've ever seen and that's saying something because if you can't tell, I play a lot of games. If you're a fan of experimentation or trying to learn a new odd game on your own, you'll get a lot more out of this. Let's build a zoo, a cutified zoo manager. 
Let's Build a Zoo feels like the Sim City of Zoo Management, a heavily simplified but interesting sim. The art is pixelated, which looks acceptable, and most tasks at the zoo are straightforward. Players need to find animals, build habitats for them, and get as many people to come to the zoo to keep it growing. But Let's Build a Zoo has a few negatives too. The tutorial is extremely weak, the gameplay is rather slow and dull, and a lot of this game is just waiting for more money. My biggest complaint though is Planet Zoo is almost 3 years old and just feels significantly better than everything I've seen here. Some breeding systems will be interesting to try out though. Pick this up if you want a simple zoo simulator, but this has been done bigger and better, and all this version of the game makes me think about is the other versions of the idea. Still, I did have fun looking at this, and if you have a young kid, this is probably the easiest version to understand. Despot's Game, a roguelike tactics game. Despot's game has a player enter a dungeon and lead a squad of humans, though leading is a relative turn. You'll be able to equip your humans, put them in formation, and then fight the enemies with minimal interactions. Players will have to balance food, upgrades, and replacing humans who unfortunately die. At the same time, there's a definite lack of interactivity. The strongest moments of the game are when you have to play through a short scene at the beginning of the level, but outside of that, you'll mostly be moving through the same encounters you saw in the previous runs. There are some great synergies, but a lot of this game comes down to being limited to what you can find to buy. Pick this up if you like what you've seen on the screen, but also realize you'll barely be doing any of this. It's mostly a game that plays out and you'll have a very small amount of interactivity here. I'm torn on this, but I'd recommend it to fans of roguelites who want to replay the game a lot, otherwise I definitely pass on it. Say hi to your dad for me. Yeah. I'm sorry Sean. Chet was a good dude. Walking Dead Season 1 and Season 2. I'm just going to combine these two titles together. Walking Dead captures the ambiguous morality that's at the center of a zombie apocalypse. Players take on the role of new characters. In the first game, it's Lee, an escaped prisoner who finds a young girl, Clementine, and then navigates a lot of dangerous situations. It's a typical Telltale game in that respect. That's also my biggest problem. The first game is the exact moment when Telltale stopped trying to make interesting games and just bought expensive licenses and made average choose your own adventure stories out of them. Then they did that about a million times more, until everyone got bored of it. There are no real puzzles, no real challenges, just make choices and see the heavily scripted experience play out. Pick this up if you're a fan of The Walking Dead. This is not a great game, but it's a great Walking Dead story, and that's what Telltale made. They took a good story, put it in a weak game, and then they gave minor choices pretending that they will have a big impact to the game, and honestly, they don't. But also, if you like The Walking Dead, you probably already played this, so you already know this. Chivalry 2 Epic Medieval Melee Combat I'm not one for multiplayer games usually, but I picked up a copy of Chivalry 2 on Steam after playing this on Game Pass. In Chivalry 2, you play as one of many knights on either side of a massive conflict, with up to 64 players on each side. You'll choose from one of four classes, with more advanced versions unlocking as you move up in the levels and ranks. There's a pretty solid combat system that can also go out the window in the middle of a massive melee, where everyone is just running around and slaughtering each other. And while I like this game, there are a few issues. There are UI problems, including points where I was unable to join either team. The control layout for the controller is weak, though mouse and keyboard are better. Finally, there are microtransactions for really no reason. They're offered as time savers, but that's the point of the game, to play and level up and earn stuff. Pick this up if you like strong melee combat and massive battles. I have previously covered Mordhau and I like Chivalry even more. If you don't have Game Pass, there will be a Melee Mayhem bundle with a PC version of this on Humble Bundle for about a week more. I'll put a link in the description. Also, this game is better if you have a small group of friends, but it's not required at all because this is a big wild battle and you can just go in arms flailing. And like... Uh, you can pick up Evil. Making me regret the social part of social deduction, and by the way, that is how they pronounce it in their tutorials. Evil is yet another social deduction game similar to Town of Salem or Among Us. The difference here is Evil puts in a lot of time to make a 3D world where players can complete quests and move around the map. In addition, with 3D, there's an ability to place traps with character abilities mattering more. 
At the same time, while it sounds like a good system, this is a bit dreadful. Playing with random players, I've already heard racist and sexist comments, enough so that I've disabled the sound for this part of the video. I tried to play three games, two times I successfully got into the game, and that game ended after five minutes, likely when the evil character is disconnected. The gameplay feels like the opposite of a normal social deduction that draws me to this type of game, with more focus on quest here. I tried to text chat, and that also didn't seem to work. Pick this up if you're going to play this only with friends, but even so, I mean, Among Us is still solid and free on mobile, the town of Salem is exactly this without the 3D world for a third of the price, and there are even more choices out there. Ultimately, I struggle to recommend this to anyone. Coral Island, Stardew Valley 2 or something like that. Coral Island can say it's based on anything, but it's so obviously an improved version of Stardew Valley, and this isn't a bad thing. You have improved visuals, what feels like an even larger world, and many more characters. There's a skill tree, and also an ability to go catch bugs. But at the same time, this feels like Stardew Valley 2, only from someone else. So what stands out to me are features from Stardew. Players like the diverse cast, but their personalities are much more subtle at first. Perhaps that's due to the number of characters here, or the other thing. This is an early access, so part of this game will change, expand, and more, like the story, the romance, and more are all not here yet. Pick this up if you want an incomplete but improved Stardew Valley. This does feel very ambitious, but it's also early access, so who knows what the game will be like when it's finally finished. I am curious about it, but I also want the full experience, not a piecemeal one. It is worth checking out though, but I'm going to wait for the final game. Dyson Sphere Program, a true nerdish delight. Dyson Sphere Program feels both fresh and familiar. A big piece of this game is building logistics similar to Factorio. You mine ore, create smelters, assemble features, and then build upwards. But unlike Factorio, this isn't about a single planet. You'll be able to travel planets, build bases, at least I assume so. It takes a long time to get going in this game. However, that addictive element of Factorio is still here. And after three hours of playing, I had to choose between losing myself in the game or stopping for the night. And I stopped, but it was very close. However, this is still in early access, which is a shame because it's so well done, but major features appear to still be missing, such as enemies to fight. Pick this up if you like Factorio, Satisfactory, or any of those nerdy games I usually like. Pretty much anything by Zaktronics probably would put you in the right area for this title. Honestly, this feels really well done and highly polished to the point that I'm going to be coming back and spending way too many hours here soon. Scorn. A lot of body horror. Scorn is a bit of a horrific game as you're about to see. I've said often I'm not a fan of horror, but Scorn didn't scare me. It's more that I hate the visual style here, which is trying to make people uneasy and succeeds. Players will move around to strange locations, solve puzzles, and eventually fight enemies, but do so as this gruesome character who often attaches weapons and items to their body. Scorn has some big problems. There are lengthy parts of this game where you're just walking in large, uninteresting spaces. The combat that I've seen isn't scary, it's more abysmal. And ultimately, I'm not that scared, more just turned off by the art, which some people are going to love, but this doesn't feel like a true horror game yet, just more a game to make people disgusted. Pick this up if you like what you've seen on screen. I picked this scene on purpose because at the same time, this was probably the best moment of my experience. The rest was pretty underwhelming. In fact, I'm going to get rid of this video. It is a bit much. Let's bring back some cutesy animals. That's better. So what about this month's lineup? Well, there's a lot of variety here. I will say that I'm finding myself put out on the early access titles. I have a ton of faith in all three. Slime Rancher 2 feels on the edge of greatness. The same is true for Coral Island. And Dyson Sphere Program has gotten a lot of well-deserved attention in the last year from the Factorio community. But except for Dyson Sphere Program, I wouldn't say the other two are really good at this moment. They're so early and they'll change quite a bit that I feel uninterested in experiencing something that I'll have to play again to get the real experience. I'm also forgetting some early access games like Valheim of course. Well, there are 16 titles this month, honestly not that many stood out to me. I found 5 that I wanted to highlight, but I also feel quite a few were lackluster, and even for games of specific genres could have been a lot better. And again, I know, Plague Tale Requiem is coming, but I chose to release this video on schedule. I promise to talk about it next time, like I said. Let's just talk about the 5 strongest games of the month. 
Starting at the bottom, we have a surprise for me, but I have to admit, Valheim lived up to the praise it's gotten from a lot of people. I'm not a huge fan of the genre, and I think the game could have had a better tutorial, at least showing how to approach the first boss, but that's why there are wikis. If you want a manly survival game, this is the one, and if you don't, there might be another survival game on this list. The fourth strongest game of this month is Dyson Spear. This is completely a personal pick, but damn it, this was so good. When something is this addictive, I just want to play so many more hours of it. Well, that's kind of what you want from a game where you're exploring planets and creating massive logistical monsters. The third strongest game this month is Grounded. I told you there might be another survival game here. While Grounded frustrated me more because of how aggressive the enemies were, the art style is what made it stand out from the other survival games I've seen. It's using the thematic elements of being shrunken in a yard to maximize efficiency, and it was extremely fun to see. I actually might be playing more of this, which is not normal for this genre. The second strongest game of the month is Chivalry 2. I'm shocked that a multiplayer only game is on my list, but that's how much I enjoyed this experience. The large melee, the more tactical battles, dealing with archers and being able to snipe as two opponents were facing off, trying to avoid hurting your team while waiting into larger combat, all of this works and creates a fantastic experience. My favorite game of this month? It's Deathloop. This is the game that I definitely would be playing more of, and after playing it for this video, I added it to my wishlist to own, and I actually now own it thanks to Humble Choice. Arcane tackled a hard concept and is doing a solid job with it. The time loop genre is not something many studios can exceed at, and there doesn't feel like there's a lot of repetition required here. And that's what I had for this month. Now I'm amazed. I've actually done a Humble Choice and a Game Pass video, and the best game for both of those is the same. I mean, it's totally not. You should totally check out that Humble Choice video. Yeah, go watch it. Go. So with that out of the way, I need to discuss something with all of you. So after last month, I did a lot of soul searching, and the fact is, I don't know if I can continue covering Game Pass like this. I've heard tons of great suggestions, but it's a bigger problem than just a video. I can spend anywhere from 60 hours to 100 hours a month on playing the games, covering them, making the video, and more. That's an average 2 hours or more a night, and remember, there's about a week there that I'm doing another video, so it's even more. This video has really got the viewership that I think this topic deserves, but I've been spending about 100 hours on a video and usually see about 500 views. It's something I've done since August of last year, and it limits what I've been doing for almost the whole month. There's a need to play what comes out on Game Pass as fast as possible, just in case more stuff just appears. And there's a lot more to this, but I've also generated a list of games that I would have played this year if I had more free time and I found at least 46 modern titles like God of War, Elden Ring, and Spider-Man that were left unfinished by me this year. The first two were barely started. Even games like Deathloop I know I won't have time to finish. There's also Judgment and Lost Judgment that I'm unwilling to start because I don't think I can give it the proper amount of time. And that's two Yakuza games I own and can't play. Ah! And I don't want to bore everyone with the long video here, so the quick version and the good news is I'm going to finish out the year. November and December will have videos, that way I can say I covered the entire year. After that point, the series will be paused, probably ending completely. I'll talk more about what I think will happen or my future plans next month, but I want to take a moment and thank everyone who has supported me on the series or channel. I know this isn't what anyone wants to hear, but I think it's the right choice to make at this time. Thanks for listening. Now, if you do want to see what's coming next or the absence of such, make sure you're subscribed and ring that bell. Listen, I have to say that that's how this YouTube thing works. Like, comment, and subscribe. And I'd love to hear from all of you about this month or the changes coming to the channel. And like always, see you next time.